nothing makes scripture come alive like being where Jesus walked and seeing places where miracles happened. We took this photo standing on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Kidron Valley in the old city of Jerusalem. This is where Jesus will set foot on the earth when he returns for the millennial kingdom. And this overlook is one of the few clearings in that area. Most of what I'm going to talk about here most everybody's heard before. It's a familiar story. But what I want to add to it are some visual aids, some history and geography that might make scripture more real in your mind and help make it come to life for you. It kind of makes the Bible in color instead of black and white. Kim and I went to Israel the first time in September 2019. And it changed everything about the way we saw scripture. For a long time, I wanted to put something together to show people what it meant, how clear the world, the word became. And preparing for my first Israel presentation, I found this map. I noticed there were two Bethanies, one down by Jerusalem and one over by the Dead Sea. At first, I thought it might be a typo, but the next morning during my daily devotional video, I saw a short segment on that very topic. And I've learned not to doubt the Lord about a coincidence like that. I learned to start taking that like a prompting from the Holy Spirit, and it kind of led me to put together this presentation. Let me show you that video clip. Corey, what did you study today? Thanks, Ryan. Well, speaking of extra details, I'm taking a look at an extra detail that uh, the Gospel of John records for us in John uh, chapter 10 in the last few verses, 40 to 42 or 43. Uh, and in this, the, the Bible tells us that Jesus went back to the place where John had been baptizing. So we're assuming this is Bethany beyond the Jordan because we know from earlier in John's gospel and the other gospels that this is the famous location of John the Baptist, you know, his preaching and his ministry and his baptizing. And we learned that people were going to Jesus to be baptized and Jesus was giving the authority for the occasion, giving the authority of the baptisms, but his disciples were actually doing the physical act of baptizing new believers uh, and new disciples kind of into the fold of uh, Jesus's followers. Um, the thing I wanna focus in on today is this concept of where Jesus actually was baptizing. Where was this Bethany beyond the Jordan? We know there was a Bethany that was close to Jerusalem. This is not the same place. The Bethany just outside of Jerusalem is obviously different than Bethany beyond the Jordan uh, in, in the gospel. So Bethany beyond the Jordan, the real question is, which side of the Jordan? Is it on the east side of the Jordan? Is it on the west side of the Jordan River? How do we know? Where is this perspective to, to you know, be speaking of Bethany beyond the Jordan. So right now you and I are gonna go back into history. We're gonna take a look at some archeology span and uh, really focus in on the information that the gospels give us to see if we can locate Bethany beyond the Jordan. The Gospel of John identifies the place where John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River. It says all this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Locating this Bethany beyond or across the Jordan has proved troubling. The debate is essentially split between those who believe it is on the western side of the Jordan River in modern day Israel, and those that hold to it meaning east of the Jordan River in modern day Jordan. A simple way of solving this should come from the Gospels. Noteworthy passages would be John 1.28 and John 10.40. In each case, across the Jordan points to an eastern location. Jesus traveled from Galilee west of the Jordan River and then went across the river to arrive on the eastern shore. He also left Jerusalem west of the river and crossed the Jordan River to arrive at the place of John's baptism. 
The trouble over this seems to have begun in the third century AD with highly respected church father Origen. Origen was unaware of a place called Bethany by the Jordan, so he proposed that the scriptures actually meant a place named Beth Arba located on the west of the Jordan. Though Origen based his conclusion on his own limited knowledge, his reputation gave weight to the conclusion. It was even put in some of the manuscript copies of the Gospels as a place name update. So where is this Bethany beyond the Jordan? West or east? The discussion continues, but ongoing excavations at a site east of the Jordan clearly show a place many Byzantine Christians believe to be Bethany. The site is now named Baptism Archaeological Park because an entire Byzantine monastery complex has been unearthed that incorporates water features, baptismal pools, natural springs, a cave, reservoirs, and water channels. The ruins of several churches have also been found here, one built up on arches to allow the floodwaters of the Jordan to pass right underneath the sanctuary. The problem of Bethany beyond the Jordan is not an easy one, but it seems that the evidence is stacked on the eastern bank. I think it's always really worthwhile to take time and do studies like this where we try to jump into that scholarly argumentation over where exactly Bethany Beyond the Jordan was. I have a clear favorite. Uh, you can probably tell by the segment that I produce, uh, but I think it's just really interesting. And I think that doing studies like this really helps anchor our minds and our understandings when we're reading through the Gospels and we see the notation that, that John says, well, now Jesus left and he went back to Bethany beyond the Jordan and he was baptizing. There's a lot of these little details that when you read through the scriptures over and over, your, your mind will pick up on them and remember them and uh, your understanding of the life and the teaching of Jesus will just become layers of understanding. Uh, and that's really what leads you to uh, a deeper appreciation for what it was that Jesus was doing and teaching in his ministry. Jesus didn't just teach with his words. He also taught uh, in some cases, not in all cases, but in some cases with his actions and how he did things, when he did things, where he did things. There's significance in why the gospel authors specifically chose to record what they did. They could have chosen many things out of the life and times of Jesus, but they very carefully um, curated the information that we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So all the details are important for us to uh, attention to. I think it's important to remember when people have visited Israel, a lot of people have said to me, it's so small compared to what I thought. And because when you read the Bible and the first time I visited Israel was 1991, before the walls were built, all those walls and all of that, mm -hmm. been there several times, many times since. But uh, I, I remember taking with the crew, walking around and seeing the places and understanding and hearing the Lord and praying. And, you know, there's nothing like praying. Um, on the Mount of Olives. It's and very cool. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. when you're talking to God from the very mountain where he will come back, mm -hmm. that's fascinating mm -hmm. and uh, really interesting. So anyway, and uh, you've been to Israel several Many years times. Ago. And mm -hmm. I know we want to go again 11, sometime. 11, 12 years oh, ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my goodness. That's yep. a long time ago. I know. Anyway, <laughs> I know. mom and I were there a few actually, years ago. A few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it, it Three. really is, Three. Yeah. Three really is <laughs> interesting to see the people involved in the places. Janet? She didn't talk much about the Bethany near Jerusalem. But it's mentioned several times in the Bible. It's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. So Jesus was there a lot. He probably stayed there sometimes when he was in the Jerusalem area. Uh, the direction I'm going to take in this video, we're going to start with the scripture that follows right after what Corey was talking about. She read, I think, verse 1 of John 4. Uh, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. That picture there is not at Bethany beyond the Jordan. That's closer to the Galilee, where we got baptized when we went there. With John 4, So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, 
he arrived at a Samaritan town, Samaritan town called Sychar, near the tract of land that J Jacob gave his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down to rest by the well. It was then about the sixth hour, about noon. Presently, when a woman of Samaria came along to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, and a woman, for a drink? For the Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. So, why did the Samaritans and the Jews not get along? So, let's take a look at who the Samaritans were. In 721 BC, the Assyrian army captured the Israelite capital at Samaria and carried away the citizens of the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. That's in 2 Kings 17. In 2 Kings 17, second part of verse 20 says, The Lord removed them from his presence. That virtual destruction of Israel left the southern kingdom, Judah, to fend for itself among the warring Near Eastern kingdoms. Assyrian policy was to scatter the inhabitants of the nations that they conquered and replace the population with inhabitants from other nations that they conquered, sort of mix them up so they couldn't fight back and rebel against them. This event brought about the lost tribes of Israel, and they're still lost. In 597 BC, Babylon, under King Nebuchadnezzar, laid siege on Judah. In 587, Babylon destroyed most of Jerusalem, including the temple. This led to the 70-year Babylonian captivity described in the book of Daniel and other Old Testament books. Judah returned after that 70 years and basically was the culture that existed at the time of Jesus. This is just a little side insert. The Temple Institute in Jerusalem believes that Herod's temple may not have been inside the walls that surround the old city today, but was rather in the city of David just outside those walls. This is a picture of the ruins from the city of David excavation just outside the walls of the old city. Uh, it may be Fort Antony, not the old city. Uh, some believe the first temple was in this area of the city of David. Now back to our story. A small portion of the tribe of Manasseh remained in Samaria, but the large majority of the occupants after the Assyrian dispersion were Gentiles from other nations. The Samaritans at the time of Christ were the descendants of those mixed nations. I want to show you another video from my morning devo devotional that was maybe a week before that other one. It talks about how Samaria in the time of Christ came about. Today, a part of our reading comes from Luke chapter 10, and in this chapter, Jesus delivers the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, or even if you're not a Christian and you've spoken with Christians or you've, uh, you know, heard some Sunday school lessons, you're going to know, chances are, the story, story of the Good Samaritan, this parable. Uh, now, this was a, 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 a strange ending to a tale, the fact that a Samaritan could be good. Now, of course, we as modern Gentiles, separated from the situation of this, uh, you know, first century AD um, Israel, we don't realize, you know, the irony in the fact that the Samaritan is the hero of this story. Samaritans were not expected to be heroes in any way, shape, or form to a first century Jew. You know, there was a huge divide and a huge rivalry that was going on between the Samaritans and the Jews, a religious rivalry, in fact. 
Right now, we are going to delve into that very issue. Why were Jews and Samaritans at odds? Take a look. The nation of northern Israel was taken over by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. The Assyrians then launched a program of banishment and resettlement on the population of Israel's capital city, Samaria. Many of the inhabitants of Samaria and its surrounding environs were deported into the Assyrian Empire, and exiles from other captured nations were resettled in Samaria. 2 Kings 17 tells us that the native Israelites remaining in Samaria intermarried with the new settlers, and what resulted was a hybrid culture with many religions. Worship to God coexisted with, and may have even been altered by pagan worship. The result was an ever-widening schism between the Samaritans and their brother Israelites and Judeans. The Samaritans held the first five books of the Bible as sacred, but they altered some of its details. Instead of Jerusalem or Shiloh as important places in early Israel, they began to teach that everything actually happened at Mount Gerizim, a mountain with biblical significance and within their territory. In the first century AD, it was said by the historian Josephus that the Samaritans had actually built a copy of the Jerusalem temple on Mount Gerizim. Modern archaeologists have now confirmed the presence of a temple on Mount Gerizim. A large, square, sacred precinct still exists with evidence of storage rooms, large cisterns, and hundreds of thousands of sacrificed kosher animal bone fragments. Coins, religious inscriptions, and a golden bell have all helped date the temple to the time of biblical Nehemiah in the 5th century BC. A marriage between the brother of the high priest in Jerusalem and the daughter of Sanballat, governor of Samaria, sparked outrage in Jerusalem. Samaritans, by that point, were considered Gentiles. So the high priest's brother had to choose between his wife and the priesthood. Instead, Sanballat came up with another idea. The Samaritans would build their own temple, and his son-in-law could be the high priest. While well, obviously solidifying the tension between those two people groups, this temple flourished for a few hundred years, finally being destroyed in the 2nd century BC. So even though this incident of the destruction, the, the building and the destruction of the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim happened significantly earlier than the first century AD, these religious uh, tensions and social tensions still existed in the New Testament. And in fact, we can see that not just uh, in this parable in Luke chapter 10, but also you know, when Jesus travels to the region of Samaria and he ends up speaking to a Samaritan woman and she is surprised that a, a Jewish man, a rabbi, would be speaking to her at all. So uh, this tension is seen uh, all throughout uh, the, the gospel narrative. So it's, good, it's a good thing to know this part of history because it really does inform some of the stories and the tensions that we read about uh, through the gospels. Right now I'm going to pass it over to Ryan. The walls that separate those societies today are a lot stronger than they were then. Uh, this is not necessarily Samaria, this is Bethlehem, but the tensions that separate are still lingering. Second Kings chapter 17 describes the Assyrian repopulation of the Northern Kingdom that Corey talked about in that video. Chapter 17 ends with, even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. A lot of people now today believe that the Palestinians that occupy a lot of that area today are descendants of the mix of the Samaritans and the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. Don't be too hard on the Jews in your thinking. We do the same thing here in America. Everybody has neighbors like the Samaritan. We all know people that don't look like us, don't act like us, don't think like us, don't believe like us. 
some of those people we just plain don't like. And Jesus said, in Luke 10 from the Amplified Bible, it puts it like this, but a certain Samaritan, as he traveled along, came down to where he was, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity and sympathy for him. Those Samaritans knew what it was like to get beat up and left for dead and everything stolen from them because that's the way they were getting treated. And Jesus was talking to people that were the ones that were treating them that way. And he's talking to us today. He asked the people that were asking him who his neighbor was, that which one of those three, there was a, I mean, everybody knows the story. There was a Levite and a Pharisee that had their excuses for passing by a guy laying on the side of the road dying. And this Samaritan who was their enemy, basically, stopped. And Jesus said, which of the three do you think proved himself to be a neighbor to him who fell among, who fell among the robbers? When Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, it kind of led into this story about this good Samaritan. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, I'm going to end with this. Lord, I pray that we can all love our neighbors as you've commanded. And that we can be neighbors when we need to be. Teach us to have your heart toward our neighbors. Teach us to welcome them into your family and lead them to you. Make us willing vessels. We thank you that somebody did that for us. We love you, Lord. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.